Great short conversation here I had in Fatima in Portugal at the International Pandemic Management Summit. And this conversation is with Dr. Claire Craig, pathologist who has done huge amounts of research into all aspects of the pandemic. And what we discuss here is essentially now all published information, but maybe not so widely available. So enjoy this short conversation. We go through some really key vectors. We're back at another COVID science uh, pandemic conference, and this time in Fatima, Portugal, which is quite beautiful. And I've met up again with Dr. Claire Craig. Great to see you. And you gave a talk yesterday, I think I'm on this morning, uh, and you went through at a high level all of the myths and the kind of data around what COVID really was. So maybe we'll just have a quick check-in on the key facts. Um, okay, so yeah, my talk covered three core myths that led to lockdown. So mm -hmm. there was the um, myth that transmission was only through close contact, mm -hmm. the myth that asymptomatic spread was a genuine driver of waves, and the myth that everybody was susceptible. So I just kind of went through the evidence on each of those, which I think a lot of people aren't that familiar with actually. <clears throat> so the first one, the close contact um, issue, was really all around a mistake that was in the public health guidelines around the size of droplets that fall to the ground within that sort of two meter radius because there's a transcription error about how big those droplets are and so that led to this mythical belief that most of viral particles were just tumbling to the ground when actually they're suspended in the air. Yeah, the, uh, absolutely the aerosol spread phenomenon, micro micro aerosol droplets and I think essentially we realized even in 2020 that they were kind of ubiquitous clouds of countless particles moving around anyone who's infected, thus rendering the lockdown and distancing kind of absurd. Quite. And so I think that's the real key point is that once you've got into your head quite how many particles an infectious person is emitting and, and once you, you know, and how many infectious people there were, you begin to realize quite how much exposure there was, you know, that everybody was exposed to it. Um, and then when you also take into account that if it's spreading through the air, then you don't have to be near the person who's spreading it. They could be sick in bed and you could be walking past their window outside and that, that could be enough. Um, and so the, with the lockdowns, if it had been close contact transmission and whether that was with people who were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, or even just out and about sick, lockdowns should have made an impact on the trajectory. And we know that they didn't. And, and that explains why they didn't, because it was in the air being spread in an airborne way. Yeah, exactly. So I think though, as that information did come out and the aerosol spread, and I know the WHO early on said it was surfaces, it was not aerosol. The WHO always seemed to say the opposite of what was coming out as reality. For instance, they said in July 2020, they declared in Reuters, etc., that COVID was not seasonal, that it was continuous wave. Right when we knew, clearly it was seasonal. We began to know, yeah. And there's more and more people now admitting that it's seasonal but not admitting the implications of that. So that's the same as with the airborne transmission. The WHO by December 2021 have said, yeah, okay, it's airborne, it's long distance. But the implications of that are ignored and everybody just remembers what they said at the beginning when everybody was paying attention much more. The implications of it being seasonal, of course, are that deaths are gonna peak in January. That's, that's when deaths from a respiratory virus peak every year. And that means that the lockdown was not the reason for that peak. And it means that the vaccines were not the reason for that peak. And, and therefore, you know, you have to look back and reassess what happened and what was done. But nobody wants to do that. Absolutely not. And it's funny, even the Iraq war and that incredible institutional corruption with Blair and Bush back then, afterwards, people kind of realized and, and acknowledged that the whole thing was corrupt around the weapons of mass destruction. This time, however, there's a resistance to acknowledge it was all wrong. I think the damage and the impact to the West was so enormous. It's not really possible to admit now in retrospect that we, we were wrong on nearly every major vector and the whole thing was kind of damaging nonsense, really? I, I, yeah, I do think what, what doesn't help is that it's not one country that was wrong. Mm. So there's this sort of 
pack behavior, which you also see with the medical regulators. You know, everyone's second guessing what everyone else is saying and doing because they don't want to be the outliers, but some, you know, someone has to lead on it. And we've seen some US states begin to lead on talking about what really went on. And I, and I kind of hope that that's where we're going to start to hear more and more truth coming out because we're not seeing it much in Europe. Yeah, Europe is an incredibly disappointing. The UK was not too bad, Ireland was disgraceful, and France, of course, with Macron was outrageous, and Austria. It's really, Europe has been particularly bad. Florida with DeSantis is a good example, of course, Texas, mm -hmm. and, you know, hopefully uh, they'll get traction going forward. I think there's an inquiry right now. It is a GOP or a Republican-led inquiry, but it has been published in the last days in Reuters and, and Wall Street Journal, uh, looking back at this and calling out some of these things. So maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but then again, Unfortunately, the damage is too enormous to ever really admit it, unfortunately. I think we're in trouble. Uh, the three key things you had then, I'll just make sure we cover them briefly before we close. So there was the whole aerosol ubiquitous spread and... Asymptomatic spread, not uh, the evidence that anybody with no symptoms who never got symptoms spread disease. It just, just doesn't it really exist. It's just tiny, tiny amounts of examples. and. Um, that, you know, that wouldn't be the case if it was a phenomenon that it's described as. So this one in three people were asymptomatic was the phrase that we kept hearing in the UK propaganda. And there's no evidence that supports that. There's just no evidence at all that supports that. When you measure an outbreak, what you see is that everybody gets symptoms in the end, even if they started off testing without them. Um, and then the, the idea that everybody was susceptible to every variant. So, you know, what we've seen in the mass, which you were saying early on, I think, was that you, you, what we were seeing was a virus finding the susceptible population and then running out a susceptible population to find. Um, and that's because only a fraction of people were susceptible to each variant, which we saw because when you looked at the proportion of people in a household that would catch it from somebody, it was always around 10% when you look at the whole wave. At the beginning it was high, but if you look back at the whole wave, it's around 10% every time. So the 90% of people were never susceptible to any one variant that was in the air. So they were exposed and they didn't get sick. Yeah, and actually I recall you're bringing back memories early on. I remember making that point, the attack rate, uh, as, as the term is. The secondary attack rate was, was locked at this sub 20%. And interestingly, in 21, when we look at the mass PCR testing across Europe, only 6% of people over two full massive seasons of massive spread were actually positive. And we know most of those were not, they were de facto immune, they had no symptoms, there was no problem. So that kind of showed that only a moderate small percentage over multiple seasons even, we're really going to have any problem or spread. Yeah, well, so I think it's like influenza. So with influenza, mm. a new strain would come. And there was, in 1957, people were really scared about a particular new strain because they thought it, nobody had any immunity to it. And they had quite a bad winter that winter, but it was around 15% of people that caught it. And then it disappeared, and then it came back, and another tranche would, would catch it. And it took a, about 11 years for that strain to pass through the population. And it skipped a year. You know, it's just, it's, it's a really funny, the behaviour of influenza is not something we fully understand. But SARS-CoV-2 has a lot of overlap with that kind of behaviour. And so ultimately, yeah, people will all have been susceptible, but over a decade, not over... A, a few months, as we were told. And actually, precisely, and I discovered early on, I, I had a, an advantage, if you will. I discovered and was sent the book by Dr. Hope Simpson yeah. of the UK, who in the 1930s set up the first influenza transmission laboratory and spent 50 years. And I know from my background, he was an amazing problem solver. He used all the logic beautifully. So a whole lifetime exploring influenza aerosol transmission. And he actually answered the questions around this largely. And the book is available. I might put the link down below to a PDF and people are interested. It's, it's stunning to read. It is. I, I really enjoyed reading his work. And, and, and it, there's so much 
There's so much depth that he goes into. He goes through all the records of, through history and the, the parish death records from yeah. his region. Oh, it's fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Incredible man. So here's to Dr. Hope Simpson. If only he were alive during this recent debacle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Indeed. Thanks, Thanks so much, Claire. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that and as always huge thanks to my supporters. It takes time and effort and expenses to travel, to do the analysis, to get out all of the scientific information and global political information more of late in a balanced way so that people can understand the world we live in today and internalize some of the more complicated data when it's translated into a form that's more palatable shall we say so huge thanks to everyone and anyone who can continue to support me it's greatly appreciated